with praise and gratitude in our hearts to thee. Father, we're so glad too that you found us. We're deep down in the darkness of sin, traveling the broad road that leads to an eternal hell. The sea bound for sleep. Lord, you set the Holy Spirit our way to arouse and awaken our sleeping soul. And we're here tonight because you found us. Amen. And when we turned to you, Lord, and cried for mercy, you bestowed mercy upon us. Tonight we're one of thy children. By no virtue of our own, but through and by the blood of the Lamb of God. We praise you tonight, Lord, for these beautiful songs, for the Spirit of God that blessed the singers as they brought forth the song, for the message of the song. We ask you now, Lord, as we turn our mind and our attention toward the Word of God, that you would touch every one of us. My God, if ever we needed a touch from heaven, we need it now. We're not able to do one thing, Lord, within a second. We know, Lord, that we can't preach your word within ourselves. We need thee. Father, as we humble our heart before you tonight, we commit our very being into your hands, asking your Spirit of God to take complete control, asking you to anoint our mental faculty. Lord, anoint our lips, anoint our hearts, help us, Father. How uh, to be just what you want us to be tonight. Here's an eternity bound people that need to hear from God. Lord, we pray not only that you would touch us, but that the Holy Spirit will touch every heart, every mind, every ear. Oh, God, may we forget time in this world and think about the glorious things of God. We commit the remainder of this service into your hands, asking that you'll confirm your will, you'll save souls, you'll sanctify believers, you'll heal the sick, and we'll humble our hearts and give your name all the praise and glory for it. Amen. And I have a message tonight that's three hours long. I'm not going to try to deliver it all tonight, folks. So just be patient. I want to use for subject tonight the reign of God's people on earth. And it'll take about that long to set forth the plan of God. <laughs> we'll try to be as brief as we can. Got somebody on the neck trying to get me to preach short ones and I can't. May the Lord bless our hearts tonight. As we look into his word, I want to read a couple of verses from the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verses 5 and 6. Then reading a few verses from the book of Revelation. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the day come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his day Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Then going into the first chapter of the book of Revelation, reading verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I turn to Revelation, the fifth chapter, and the tenth verse. 
and hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Now with these scripture verses as a foundation, I say my subject tonight, and the Lord willing, tomorrow night will be the same, the reign of God's people on the earth. You look back here to this first scripture lesson in the book of Jeremiah, prophetic honor from the pen of Jeremiah. The Lord said the days are coming that I raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth and in his days Judah shall be saved. That sounds good to me. In his days Judah shall be saved. Now, there isn't a doubt but what this is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ, the first coming. A prophecy of his first advent into the world as the long promised Messiah. Yes. Jesus Christ fulfilled every prophetic utterance yes. of the Old Testament prophets concerning the coming Messiah. And not only that, but he did reign as a king when he was here on earth the first time. Read the 18th chapter of John, verses 33 through 37. You'll find Jesus before Pilate's judgment hall. I being questioned, and Pilate put the question to him, Are thou the king of the Jews? He said, Did you ask that of yourselves, or did others tell it thee of me? Why, he said, am I Jew? Your own people, your own nation, the chief priests, have delivered you unto me. What hast thou done? And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered unto the Jews. But now he said, my kingdom is not from him. Then Pilate said, art thou then a king? Jesus answered and said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world to bear witness of the truth. And all those that are of the truth, hears my word, my voice. Now will you hear it tonight? He stated emphatically, I am a king, to this end was I born. It makes little difference to me what the blind teachers of the malarious, malarious doctrine has to say, that he's coming back in the future, his second advent, uh, he's going to be made king and reign on the earth. I'm glad he's already king and already reigned on the earth and is yet reigning tonight as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Brother, he reigned on the earth when he was here the first time. He reigned over all the powers of earth and hell, spiritually and literally. Everything was under his command. He went out preaching the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, or of, of God the Father, bearing heaven's message, and he had power over demons. He spoke the word and commanded demons to depart from the hearts of men. Legions of devils came under his power. They were expelled. They were cast out of the hearts of men and women. As he went about, he healed all manner of disease. He had power over spirits. He had power over diseases. And even the universe upon which we live tonight was under his command when he was here the first time. He was out on the Sea of Galilee, the winds blowing terrible, the hills tossing high, and the little boat shipping water, and in danger of plunging to the bottom, and he was found asleep in the stern of the boat. And the disciples woke him up and said, Master, don't you care whether or not we perish? And Jesus spoke the word and the winds and the uh, storms ceased to beat and there was a great calm. One day he and his party came into Capernaum and the tax collectors 
Internal revenue came to Peter. And, and, yeah, and came to Peter and said, does your master pay taxes? They still check up on us yet. Peter said, yes. Yeah. They went on into a house and Jesus said, Peter, who do the kings and the rulers of this earth, this earth take custom and tribute from their own children or strangers? He said, they take it from strangers. He said, then are the children free. But he said, lest we should offend them, he said, you go down and fish a little bit. Yeah. Cast the hook into the sea, and the first fish you catch, open his mouth, there'll be a piece of money in there. And you pay his, your taxes and mine too. Amen. Everything was under his command. Where's the fish? Get that coin, brother. God put it in there. God put it in there, and Jesus was there when he sent Peter down again. Yeah, sure did. I want you to see that he was a king and all things were under his command when he was here the first time. Now there's a lot of preaching, a lot of writing, and a lot of rejoicing among professed Christian people uh, over the idea that he's coming back one of these days and he's going to set up his kingdom on the earth and he's going to rule on a literal throne over an old a literal Jerusalem, and then the saints will reign here on earth with him a thousand years. I might surprise you and give you a little joke right here. But I want to tell you tonight, there isn't one scripture in the lids of the New Testament that tells us Jesus Christ will ever set his foot on the earth again. There isn't one scripture in the lids of the New Testament that teaches us that the literally or bodily resurrected saints will ever live on the earth with Jesus Christ. The millennial doctrine is absolutely without any scriptural foundation whatsoever. But if you study the Bible line upon line and precept upon precept, you'll find that the kingdom of God is a present reality and that the saints of God, those who have full salvation and the light of the gospel has been shed abroad in their hearts, they are reigning with Christ right now. Thank God the true saints of God are reigning over Satan, over sin, over self, over the world, over the beast, over his image, over his heart, and over his name. They have the victory. Glory be to God. They're reigning in this life. Thank God for victory. Amen. I want to get down into the doctrine of the Bible. I don't have any fairy tales or any sizzle book catalog stories to give to you. The Word of God's the thing that's going to stand up in the last day. And it's the only thing that will stand now and do the work that you need to be done in your heart and life. The Word of God. Before Jesus Christ came into the world, Sin held dominion over the entire human race. From Adam right on through to the first advent of Jesus Christ, the whole human race was bowed under the power and the dominion of sin. That first man, Adam, back there, which was earthly, stands at the head of the whole human race, which today is estranged from God, and the beauty of holiness that was uh, created in the first two creatures has been marred and fellowship has been broken because of the first sin committed by the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. Paul teaches us in Romans 5 and 12 that by one man sin entered into the world. And death by sin, so death passed upon all mankind, for that all have sinned. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, the Apostle Paul said, For by man came sin, and by man came also resurrection of the dead, or from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. One man brought sin and condemnation upon the whole human race. And through the righteousness of one man, the whole human race can become justified unto life eternal if they'll accept it. 
Satan beguiled Eve back in the garden. Adam wasn't deceived in the transgression, but Eve was deceived in the transgression. He took the fruit and ate of it. She gave Adam uh, the fruit. He ate of it, thus constituting the first sin that was ever recorded uh, in history. And when they sinned, they plunged the whole human race into the depths of sin and separation from God. That blessed state of holiness had been marred. Our fellowship with God had been broken because of that one transgression. I just well nail the thing down here as we get started into the thing. I just well tell you the Bible teaches us that the whole human race stands condemned and guilty before God as a result of that one sin. I know that statement people don't like, but it still thus saith the Lord. The whole human race stands condemned before God because of Adam's transgression. Adam's posterity came into this world not in the image of a righteous and a holy God. They came into this world in the image of fallen Adam. Romans 5 and 18, the apostle Paul said, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That isn't hard to understand, is it? You may say, well, preacher, read the rest of it, I will. It doesn't alter the first statement. Romans 5 and 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, we've got Adam and Christ pictured here. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came on all men under justification of life. Now, let me say there isn't one scripture in all the Bible that will contradict or alter or take away the truth from Paul's first statement in that verse. Amen. But there are scriptures in the Bible that will place conditions upon that justification that's offered through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Turn right over here to Galatians 2 and 22, 3 and 22 rather. Paul said here, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. To them that believe. There are conditions attached to the last part of that 18th verse. But I say, say again, the first part of it stands as truth yet tonight. And here in Romans 5 and 14, Paul said, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even upon them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Well, what does the word similitude mean? It just means a similarity or resemblance or a facsimile. And Paul's telling us right here in substance, uh, that from Adam to Moses, death reigned even over those people who did not sin after the similarity of Adam's transgression. Right. Yet, death was reigning over them. That's right. Romans 3.23, Paul said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 and 10, John said if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his truth or his word is not in us. Listen, this is not an involuntary or a voluntary sin they're talking about. It's an involuntary sin. It's a guilt and a condemnation that's thrust upon the whole human race as a result of one man's transgression back in the Garden of Eden. Every one of us was born into this world with a sinful, rebellious nature within us. Everyone, for uh, David said in Psalms 51 and 5, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He said in uh, Psalms 58 and 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies. Listen, there's never been a baby born into this world, including you, 
and me uh, who didn't come with a rebellious nature in our very soul and being. Mother's a little top that doesn't know right from wrong, doesn't know anything about sin at all. But listen, they'll raise up, there'll be a nature of rebellion raised up against you, against discipline, against law, and against order. Where did it come from? We was everyone born wrong. Everyone was born with a rebellious nature in our very being. That's the reason we have to be born again. Because the first one was a wrong one. Right. Mother, if people wasn't born with that rebellious nature in them, please tell me why of all the billions of earth there is one or two comes along now and then and goes straight. I say tonight, if we ha was not born into the world with a corrupt, rebellious, sinful nature in us, then we don't have any need of a divine work of grace to change the heart of the nature that's within us. Amen. Don't need any miracle of salvation. That just cancel it off. All we need to do is make a decision we're going right. From here on and head in that direction. I want to tell you, friend, that's the curse of the day. The teaching today that there's no such thing as a miracle uh, in the plan of salvation and no such thing as a need for a change in the nature of man. Whether it takes a divine miracle, a divine miracle in your heart to change your very nature before you'll ever live according to the teachings of God's Word. It'll take more than a decision on your part. It'll take that, but it'll take more than that. It'll take a decision, and then you'll have to meet some conditions in God's Word, and then God Himself will have to work a miracle in your little heart. Peter said, we have given to us exceeding great and precious promises, and that through these, we might be a partaker of the divine nature of God. Brother, we didn't have that divine nature back then. If we had then God would never have made any promises that through those promises, we might become a partaker of the divine nature. Make the change in the very nature of man in order to live for God. Paul, down through the centuries of time, sin has held dominion over the human race. God has spoken all through the annals of time, through his prophets, he's spoken through men of God, but never did he give anything with a cleansing in it to straighten up the nature in man's heart until Jesus came. Amen. When he even gave the law to Moses, how to pass on to the children of Israel to govern and to guide their conduct and their life. But in the Mosaic alone, there was not one thing to change the heart or change the nature of man. And God gave them in that law a holy law, and they could not keep that holy law because of the sinful nature in them. Yeah. Right. Right. The law wasn't given to bring righteousness. God didn't give the law to straighten man out. He gave the law to restrain sin and to withhold sin until the seed should come to whom the promise was made and a Savior should be born who would deliver man from sin and enable him to live above sin. The Apostle Paul dealt in the book of Hebrews of the shortcomings of the law. He said there was barely a disannulling of the commandments going before. Why were they disannulled? Because of the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For he said the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. He said in the ninth chapter, speaking of the law, that it was a figure uh, of things uh, to come, wherein he said were offered gifts and sacrifices which could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to comfort. But thank God I'm glad to tell you that when Jesus Christ appeared on the scene, there was a change of dispensation. And the law was set aside as a worn-out garment. It wasn't destroyed. It was merely set aside. 
Romans 10 and 4, the apostle Paul said, Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For oh, I can picture the children of Israel bowed under the galling yoke of sin and also struggling under uh, the yoke of the law, a holy law, but a sinful nature in here working against that holy law. The apostle said we couldn't keep it. Our fathers shouldn't, neither can we. Right. I can picture those Israelites in that condition. And along comes the prophet Isaiah yeah. under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He began to make promises that encourage them and strengthen the weak by telling them that God's going to come and save them. In the 35th chapter of Isaiah, the 3rd and 4th verses, listen what he said. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say ye, or say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not, for behold, your God will come with vengeance even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. He will come and save you. I believe those people took courage. I believe they took courage. The weak was strengthened because of this promise that God's going to come uh, and save you. And then the prophet uh, Jeremiah spoke uh, of a time coming when God would I uh, put a new heart and a new spirit within you. Yeah. Wash you and cleanse you from all your filthiness yeah. and from all your idols. Brethren, they look forward with great anticipation to the coming of the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. Now Isaiah is definitely prophesying in that 35th chapter of the coming of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Coming to save the people from their sins. Now, if Christ didn't save when he came, then what was his purpose of coming? What did he accomplish? We've got people the length and breadth of Christendom today preaching you can't live without sin. Well, pray tell me, what did Jesus do when he came? Did he just come down to earth to look the situation over? Just a few days before I left home, I called a heating company, trying to contact the man that run the business, and his secretary answered the phone. She wanted to know who was on the other end, I told her. When she found out I was a minister, she began to preach to me. First of all, she let me know she was a Christian. And the superintendent of the junior department and the Sunday school at the Methodist church, the corner so and so and so and so, and went on just like a phonograph record. One of those feminine machines. I like my tape recorder because it can cut it up. She began to inform me that even though she's a Christian, she sinned and I sinned and everybody else sinned. And she just preached to me a long sermon and I began to wonder if I was going to be able to witness for the Lord. She just run out like a tape machine or a phonograph machine. Finally, she slowed down on the curve and I got a word in. And I began to preach to her holiness thing. She's a member of the Methodist Church, but she's got Baptist doctrine. She's all messed up. She's all messed up. Well, she's only one out of thousands upon thousands who have been taught, and many of them are honest. She was honest and sincere in what she believed. You mean to tell me that you can live without sin? Well, I said, I am doing it anyway. You mean to tell me you don't make any mistakes? I said, listen, sister, that's where you're off the track. A mistake is not a sin. Brother, as long as we're in this old tabernacle of clay, we're going to err in our judgments many times. We're going to make mistakes. The only man who never made a mistake is the man who never did anything. But a mistake is not a sin. I tried to get her straightened out. I'm confident that I didn't because she's already died in the world before I ever met her. But I think she's only one out of millions today 
who believe that you can't live without sin. Well, why did Jesus come into the world? Then we've got numbers of others who are teaching that when he came the first time, he didn't set up his kingdom, but he's going to come back the second time and set it up. I'd like for somebody to inform me what did he do when he was here. If he didn't die to save men from sin, and if he didn't set up his kingdom, then what did he do? Why was he here in the world? You read the first chapter of Matthew, haven't you? Where Mary is speaks of Mary and the birth of Jesus. She was a spouse of Joseph, a just man. And when Joseph detected she was great with child, he was shocked. And he decided in his own heart, I'll set her away privately. Brother, he loved that woman. And he knew if he exposed her and her condition, the law said, stone her to death. He didn't want to see her die. He loved her. So he said, I'll just, or decided in his own heart and mind, I'll just set her away privately and say nothing about it. But God sent an angel down to put him wise as to what's going on here. He said, Joseph, thou son of David, hear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I still believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That which is in her is conceived of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The prophet Zechariah said in 13 and 1, And in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and unclean. Brother, I'm glad when Christ went to the cross, his blood was shed, that fountain was open, and it's still open tonight, friends, to wash away the stain of sin and to break the power of sin in the life of any individual that will meet God on his terms and on his conditions. Now, Jesus Christ, when he was here in the world, was brought before Pilate's judgment hall and condemned without a charge. Trumped up charges. Had no actual fault uh, in him. Had to suborn false witnesses to stand and lie against him to get rid of it. He was taken out on Golgotha's brow, and there he was nailed on the cross and suspended between earth and heaven. And I want to tell you, he did not die as a martyr to a lost cause. He was God's sin offering for the whole world. And when he died there, he died that you and I might go free from the bondage of sin and might be reconciled unto God. He was not a martyr to a lost cause, but he was God's sin offering for the whole human race. First Peter 3 and 18, the apostle Peter says there that Christ once suffered for sin. Hebrews 10 and 10, the apostle Paul speaks there of the sacrificing of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Thank God the millionaire can't get salvation unless he comes the same way I can. There's no offering, no sacrifice that man can make that'll bring salvation to him. God Almighty made the sacrifice when he gave his only begotten son on the cross of Calvary, and we'll have to accept that sacrifice or die and go to hell forever. Thank God for the great plan of salvation. God came all the way from heaven to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, and sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary. And I say, beloved, when Christ was here on the earth, he did save people from their sins right then and charged them to go and sin no more. Read the fifth chapter of Matthew, the first 14 verses. You'll read about his trip out to the sheep market. Where the angel came down and stirred the waters once every year. And after the waters were troubled, the first individual who stepped in was healed. 
And the account tells us there were multitudes of lame and maimed and blind and sick of every kind. They're waiting on the troubling of the water. And Christ walked up to a man who had an infirmity 38 years and asked him if he'd like to be well. Why, well, he said certainly he would like to be. But he said, when the waters are troubled, while well, I'm trying to get in, somebody steps in ahead of me. Oh, thank God for the love and the compassion in the heart of the Son of God. He said, take up your bed and walk. And that very moment, the power of God healed that man. He shouldered his bed and walked. Yeah, those old moss-back hypocritical Jews collared him, of course, and told him it's unlawful for you to carry your bed on a Saturday. Who told you to do that? Well, he said, he that he. He didn't know who healed him. Jesus just slipped out of the picture and lost himself in the trap. But the Bible goes on to tell us Jesus met him later on and told him, Now you're made whole, go and sin no more. Father, God gave him a double dose right there that day. He saved him from sin and also healed his sick body. That double experience is still available today. Amen. Turn to the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John and you'll find another account of, the, uh, of Jesus Christ telling an individual to go out and sin no more. Yes. Scribes and Pharisees brought the woman who had been taken in adultery before Christ, wanted him to condemn her. Now the Lord Moses said this woman ought to be stoned to death, but what do you have to say? He didn't have much to say. He just began to write on the ground. They pressed the issue. And he stood up and looked them in the face and he said, Let the one among you that's without sin. That's the first stone. Stooped down and began to write on the ground again. And they become guilty in their own conscience and began to file out of the picture, out of the crowd. Finally, Jesus rose and looked to the woman and said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, I know a lot of preachers are interpreting that to mean, Go and don't commit any more adultery. Well, it did mean that. But it means all other sin. He said, go and sin no more. Any kind and all kinds. Go and sin no more. Amen. You know when Peter was preaching on Solomon's porch, the day the lame man was healed at the gate beautiful, he preached, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. For he said, God raised up Jesus and sent him unto you to bless you and to turn every one of you away from your iniquity. To turn you away from your iniquity. Well, John said in 1 John 5 and 18, Whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. Amen. I say while he was here on earth, he forgave people of sin and charged them now live without it. Amen. Now I'll say he saves from sin today and delivers from the power of sin today as much as he ever did. Sin is man's greatest enemy. We're either reigning over sin or sin is reigning over us. One of the two. Well, what does the word reign mean? It means to have dominion over or it means to exercise sovereign power or authority over. And we're either exercising dominion over sin, we are exercising power and authority over sin, or it is exercising it over us, one of the two. Amen. Now Paul said in Romans 6 and 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Then in the 14th verse he said, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law but under grace. Yes. Back under the law, sin had dominion over them. But he's teaching them now that sin shall not have dominion over you. You're living under grace. Amen. 
Turn right back here to Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 20 and 21. He said, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brother, I'm glad tonight we're living in the dispensation of grace where grace does much more abound and sin will have to bow out of the picture if we surrender our hearts and lives to God and get a real Bible experience of salvation. Amen. 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 I want you to take a Bible look at the human race under sin. The wise man said in Proverbs 5, 22, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden or held or bound by the cords of his sin. Let me say, sinner friend, every time you commit one more sin, it means one more cord has been thrown around you to bind you the tight. Every time you go out and get drunk, it means that there's one more cord around you drawn a little tight. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his now listen to what Paul said here in the 7th chapter of Romans starting at verse 15 he said for that which I do I allow not for what I would that do I not but what I hate that do I isn't that a picture of bondage captivity servitude and he attributed it every bit to the sin that dwells in me. Verse 20. He said, Now then, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Brother, he was a captive. He was a slave to sin that was dwelling in him. And that sin would make him do things he didn't want to do. And the thing that he desired to do, he had no power to execute that, but there was an unseen power in him that demanded him to do something. Well, I don't have to go into any detail explaining that. We're ever last one acquainted with the fact that sin is a reality, and sin is a power, and gets right in us, and demands us to do things we don't want to do. It'll demand you many times to open your mouth and let your tongue run a while when you'd rather have kept it shut, but you just couldn't do it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Sin has power about it. Yeah, I know a lot of people try to make Romans the seventh chapter the picture of Paul's experience of salvation, but brother, that's a mistaken idea. Amen. Get on over in the eighth chapter and you'll find Paul experience of salvation he said there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for he said the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death Amen. thanks be to god i'm glad tonight there's power in the blood of jesus to reduce the powers of sin and to deliver us from the law of sin and allow us to walk according to the Spirit of God. Amen. Thank God. Now I want you to take an actual look at the human race under sin. And if you look at the human race today, you will see the actual scene as pictured here in the seventh chapter of Romans. People doing things that they don't want to do. Other men today are bound by and they are driven by sinful, lustful, shameful habits that's wrecking and ruining them morally and spiritually and mentally and physically. Brother, sins at the very bottom of the trouble of the human race today. 
sin at the very bottom. I say that sin is real and sin is powerful. There's too many people think they can outreason sin. Too many people think they can cope with that old lustful uh, passion that's within them. I want to tell you right now, beloved, that firm convictions and high standards are not sufficient to give you victory over those lustful, sinful things in your very nature. Right out on the real battlefield of life, in the crucible of life, brother, we'll have to acknowledge that self-control, all that we can muster, self-control, firm convictions, high standards, all something outside the realms of the human to loose your friends from those things. Oh, the bondage of sin. How it drives men on and on to do things they don't want to do. Yes, sir, you say, preacher, I can quit doing this or that. I used to work with a man who said he could quit smoking whenever he got ready. I said, strange thing, you never get ready. Oh, he said, I quit for so long a time. I said, you didn't quit, you just laid off, you're still smoking. How to see you can people be. I used to struggle around with the thing. Doing things that little ought not do and things that I didn't want to do. And I'd say, I'll not do that anymore. And brother, I'd quit for a while, but I'd jump right over here and do something just as bad as that. It's just like a fellow would tell him not to smoke anymore. So he throws his cigarettes away and gets a pack of mail pouch. And he puts a big hood in his mouth. It begins to eat it, say. You just well puff on it just to eat it. Those sinful, unclean habits have men down today and they can't get loose of themselves. Not only that habit, but the drink habit and many other sinful, lustful things that's driving men to wreck and ruin, to wretchedness, destroying lives and homes and turning children out in the street as almost orphans and damning souls by the millions. The power of sin. Men drink it like water, roll it under their tongue as a sweet morsel, and the preacher gets up and pats it all on the back. God have mercy on it. I'm glad there's a remedy for sin. Thank God I'm glad there's a plan of salvation and we can have deliverance from the powers of sin. Amen. We can reign over sin. Now I want you to take a Bible look at the saints of God. Amen. Go to First Peter 2, 9 and 10. And Peter said there, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What? Yes, a holy nation, a holy people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. And holiness is the extreme opposite of sinfulness. You'll never be holy while you're committing sin, and you'll never commit sin while you're holy. They're incompatible. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, called you out of sin, under his marvelous light which were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thank God for the people of God, a holy nation. Brother, listen, God sent his son into the world to die on the cross of Calvary to purchase and to raise up a new nation. A nation of holy men and women, whether they be Jews or Gentiles. Brother, the racial barrier's been broken down centuries ago. A Jew's no more in the sight of God than a Gentile. Salvation is offered to the whole human race. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. There's salvation for all the human race and all who will accept 
salvation are gathered together into the one fold and constitute a holy people. Fit to inhabit the courts of heaven in the presence of a holy God. Made such right here in this world. Amen. Go back to Paul's writings to Titus. The second chapter, verses 11 through 14. And he said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Thank God for the grace that brings salvation. Has appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good work. Oh, my heart goes up in praise and gratitude to God tonight for the great plan of salvation that Jesus shed his blood to redeem me, to buy me out of the clutches of Satan and sin and form within me that which would enable me to live above sin. Thank God for his plan of salvation. Amen. Now go back to Romans 6, chapter, verses 16 through 18. And Paul said, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But he said, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you being then made free from sin. Well, glory, being made free from sin. You become the servants of righteousness. Well, know what kind of doctrine you live in, brother Amen. I'm glad tonight for that deliverance. I'm glad for the day God found me down in the very gutter of sin, running after the things of this old world, bound by evil, sinful habits, Brother, if God hadn't have found me and saved me, I might be in hell tonight. Oh, I'm glad I thank the Lord for reaching down into the depths of sin and putting my soul under arrest and helping me realize I was lost and away from him, headed toward the devil's hand. Thank God for it. Yes, Paul said, thank God you obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I want to tell you again, beloved, God's saints are holy. They are sinless. They're delivered from the habits of life that's polluting the nature of man and destroying him. They are followers of the Lamb. Amen. Followers of the Lamb. They follow the Lamb with us wherever He goes. Amen. And we'll deal with that some tomorrow night with the Lord will. One thing to get victory and reign over sin is another thing to reign over the beast. Amen. Well, someone asked, how can it be? How can people live without sin? Brother, I want to tell you, it's through no human process. It isn't through the exercising of any of our self-will that it can be done. It isn't through any human process of uniting with some church and getting your name on the church roll book. Church membership won't do it. It's not through any resolutions of our own. Now, we're going to make some resolutions. No more of this and no more of that. No more of something else. You make a few and you'll find out that you're not the master of the situation. 
you'll find out there's an unseen power that will tell you what to do, even though you don't want to do it. Oh, those old uncontrollable things. You know, I used to ride a bicycle when I was a boy. I wore out a couple of them, I guess. And I'd have a breakdown. And I'd get to working on that bicycle and try to fix it. And I couldn't make much headway. It wasn't enough of a mechanic to fix it. I'd take that bicycle and I'd throw that thing on the ground. And I'd look at it and I'd say, I wish you had life so I could hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> Brother, that's city police. <laughs> now I told on myself, and I expect some of you could tell some tales on yourself would be as bad as not one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Might have been your wife. Yeah, it might have been your wife. It might have been your husband you threw a dish at. Catch him across the nose. See, making people do a lot of things that don't want to do. That's right. Have a fit of jealousy. Plunge a knife in somebody and take their life instantly. Thirty minutes later, regret it to the bottom of your heart. But it's already done. Have no control over yourself. Oh, thank God. There's a way we can be delivered from those things. A way we can be delivered from those things. You know, I copied an article out of the Gospel Trumpet magazine. Any of you folks ever see the Gospel Trumpet? October 2, 1906, the issue. It was an article written by J.R. Tackett. I don't suppose he'd mind me calling his name because he wrote the article and put it out for the world to read. No use for me to withhold his name. He's an outstanding preacher in a certain organization that bears the name Church of God. The title of that article was The Truth Shall Make You Free. Yes, I got it. The Truth Shall Make You Free. And in the fourth part of that article, he said, if you've got any bad habits you want to get loose from, he said, I've got a few simple rules here. If you'll obey them, you can be free. Now he said, you spend the first week saying, I want to quit this habit. And he said, you repeat that phrase all day long, and when you wake up at night, when you go to bed, when you get up in the morning, you're going around the factory over there, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit. I tell you about Wednesday, that first week, they're going to hunt you a psychiatrist and see what happens. Yeah, they you're going nuts. But he said, spend the first week repeating, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit. How you really kind of, I want to quit this habit, I want to quit this habit. That man's going to say. No, he's just trying to get loose from sin. Then he said, spend the second week saying, I'm going to quit this habit, I'm going to quit this habit. Or I can quit this habit, I can quit this habit, I can quit this habit. I can quit this habit. And he said, believe it down in your heart. And then he said, spend the third week saying, I will quit this habit, I will quit this habit, I will quit this habit. And he said, while you're doing that, from the depths of your heart and believing it, he said, you just watch the fibers of your soul strengthen itself and eventually it'll cleanse itself. Cleanse itself. That's what it's called. It'll cleanse itself. And he said, one of these fine mornings, you'll wake up and find that you're a different creature. That's it. A stench in the nostrils of God. Jesus wasn't brought in the picture at all. Just want to quit the habit, want to quit the habit, can quit the habit, can quit the habit, will quit the habit. And I say you will not quit it in that night. That's rank deception from the pits of the lost world. Whether it men could get loose from the bondage of sin within their own power, God would have never yielded. As to the plan of sacrificing his own son. It took that to bring about deliverance for the soul of man. Nothing short of the blood of Jesus Christ can deliver or cleanse men from the power of sin. 
It'll take that. Amen. Wake up some fine morning feeling like a new Christian. Well, I woke up one fine night and was a new Christian. Not because I went through any drills of that kind, but because I humbled my heart at a place of prayer and repented and believed God and He broke the power of sin. Thank God for that. And let him free. How does it happen? How can it be? It takes a divine work. It takes a divine work. What did John say in our second scripture lesson? Revelation 1, 5 and 6. He said, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood. You'll never be washed from your sins unless it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. No other way to get loose. Your soul is stained and besmirched in the sight of God with the sins of your life. And only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash it all away. And he said he washed us in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God. And I tell you, not a deposed king either. But one that's reigning now. Thank God. Amen. One that's reigning now. Amen. Paul said in Romans 5 and 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Oh, thank God tonight. He's the Prince of Kings. All the saints are kings, and he's the Prince of all of them. Thank God. He's the Prince of all of them. You didn't know you had a king preaching to you tonight, did you? But you have. Amen. Thank God for the great plan of redemption. Full salvation. Full salvation makes us kings in that we rule over sin. We have dominion over sin. We have dominion over ourselves. We are the master of every situation. See, I don't believe that. Then you're not reigning. God bless. Amen. You're not reigning. When things don't go to suit you and somebody curses you out, if you don't have power to keep your mouth shut, you don't have mastery over the situation. Amen. When people fly off the handle and do things on the spur of the moment and under pressure that they regret later and things that are wrong, you're not ready. Amen. You're not ready. You don't have victory. Something in here that you don't have control over. It jumped up right quick and did something you didn't want. That's not victory. You're not a king. You're not a reign. If that's the situation. I say full salvation makes us king. Too many people have just started and gone part of the way and then stopped. What do you mean by full salvation? I mean that full salvation is constituted of two experiences. First one is repentance and being born of the Spirit of God. All sin is washed away. You're forgiven. New life comes in. And the second one is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the very nature within you is changed. And you become a partaker of the divine nature of God. The Holy Spirit reigning in them. Too many people have made the start and didn't go on uh, and obtain the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and that old sinful nature still in there. It raised up again and destroyed everything they had obtained in the first. Amen. Thank God for full salvation. Your experience is not complete until you're born of the Spirit and then baptized with the Spirit. God changes our heart. He changes our very nature in the full plan of salvation. And people who have that experience are reigning over 
Satan, sin, self, the world, the beast, his image, his mark, and his name. There are kings reigning right here in this life. Brother, it's the moral and the spiritual world that we reign over. Amen. Too many people got their eyes on the material one. Yeah. And they want to reign here over the material thing. Brother, you better dismiss that idea if that's in your heart and mind. It's the moral and the spiritual world. Amen. Thank God tonight for the great sacrifice that was made on Calvary. That you might go free. That I might be free. And to you who may be here tonight in sin. Our evil habits have bound you until you can't get loose from it. You don't have the power within to live like you know you ought to live. There's an experience available for you tonight right here at this altar of prayer. God has it. It's been paid for centuries ago. And God's waiting on you to come and receive it. Sinners, there's deliverance for you. There's deliverance from every sinful habit. Every lustful thing, everything that's got you bound, you can be free from it tonight. If you'll meet God's conditions right here. Are you reigning tonight? Oh, thank God for that beautiful song we sang a few minutes ago. I am reigning, sweetly reigning, far above this world of strife. Let men rage and cave around. Brother, you can reign above it all with sweet seeds of heaven in your soul. Do you have the experience? We're going to sing a closing hymn tonight uh, and let you go home. But first of all, we want you to listen to God. We want you to hold steady, everyone. It isn't late yet. Midnight show hasn't started yet. It's early yet. When it's time for you to find God. So may the Lord help you tonight to realize the price has been paid. The blood has been shed. All provisions have been made. The supper is spread. You can come and protect. Shall we pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, we humble our hearts in your presence again this evening. The closing hour of this service, so thank you, Lord, for the service. Thank you for the entire day. But, Lord, especially for this service now, we're still in. We thank you for the good singing, the inspirational singing. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Now, that points out to us the great plan of salvation, a way of deliverance. Uh, from the enemy of our soul and from sin uh, that's destroying the masses of people today. Lord, we pray as we sing this closing hymn that your spirit will deal with some precious heart. No doubt in this audience are souls uh, that are bound uh, by evil habits, sinful things, uh, things they would like to refrain from, uh, but they don't have the power to do it. Help them to realize tonight, O oh Lord, uh, that there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's power to save from sin today. There's power to keep them from sin. Lord, let the Holy Spirit of conviction seize their hearts and draw them to this altar of prayer. Really, we'll praise you, Paul. Amen. Amen. Now, friend, if you're here tonight, we'd like to impress upon your heart and mind Something that Brother Barber has brought so vividly in his message tonight. Just a few months ago, possibly three months ago, I had one of the most shocking things happen to me. You know, if you're out in sin tonight, you don't know what you'll do. You just don't know what you'll do. I know people, I know my own experience, that there was a time when I was in sin that I thought I could take control of the situation. You know, you can make a resolution. You could make a good determination that you wouldn't do this thing again, as we've been hearing tonight. But when sin gets a hold of us and we're in the enslavement of it, I want to say tonight, you don't know what you'll do. A person in sin doesn't know what they will do. We want to impress this upon your heart and mind tonight. And I'm confident tonight in an audience this size, there must be someone that needs God. It's out in sin. A few months ago, 
I heard the very tragic news that a young father, 35 years old, a man that I'd ever known ever since he was a boy, had gone up into the hills and had borrowed a gun and blew his brains out. I'm confident if you'd ask Niall Hayes a few weeks before, if he would have ever considered such a thing, he'd have said, why, of course not. Brother Conrad, you must have lost your mind. I want to say tonight, if you're in sin, you don't know what you'll do. When you're serving the devil, you don't know what you will do. No, you don't. No, you don't. You may have the most serious thoughts. You, must, you may be able to consider many things and say, well, I wouldn't ever think of doing such a thing. Niall Hayes didn't think he would either. No, he didn't. I talked to his wife. I hadn't seen her for two or three years. And yet the Lord brought me across her path within just two or three hours after I'd heard this tragic news in a shoe shop. And I spoke to her. I conveyed to her my sorrow and my heartache. And I tried to convey to her the reason for which I thought that the thing happened. And she said, you know, Brother Conrad, the very thing that Nile looked to wasn't able to help him. I want to say tonight, friend, psychiatry isn't the answer. I want to say tonight there is nothing in the world that can take care of sin in men's hearts except the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is still the answer to men's problems. He's still the answer to the sin problem. And if you're here tonight and you think you can sweat this thing through, you can wrestle it through, you can work it through some way or other, I want to say tonight, you don't know what you'll do. You don't know what you'll do. If you're here in sin tonight, you don't know what you'll do tonight or tomorrow. As long as you're serving Satan, Satan can get you to do most anything you want to, he wants you to do. If you'd have asked Mr. Hayes a few months before, I'm confident that Niall would have said, why, I wouldn't even consider such a thing. And the minister, if you can call him a minister that stood at the podium and preached the funeral service, tried to give condolence to the family and tell him that Niall had gone on to heaven. My friend, tonight when we serve sin, we don't know what we'll do. If you're here tonight, I would plead with you. The church would plead with you. Almighty God pleads with you tonight through a moving of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. Find him, get right with him before it's tragically too late. You don't know when that hour may be. If you're in sin tonight, you don't know what you'll do. And so we plead with you tonight. We're going to sing one more verse that God may speak to you and move upon your heart and cause you to be disturbed and to recognize that outside of Jesus Christ, you don't know what you'll do with your life and your family. A man that had three beautiful little children had everything to live for, but he was as steeped in sin, steeped in sin, raised in the Church of God family. My God tonight, friend, if you're here and you're without Jesus Christ in your heart and the shed blood applied to your heart, find him, find him. I tell you, if you recognize how much you needed God, you would run to this altar tonight. You'd do anything. You'd crawl, as Brother Barber has said. You'd, ha you'd run down here somewhere, somehow. You'd get here if you recognize the deplorable, the treacherous, the terrible condition that you're in. Find him tonight while there's time and while there's opportunity. For tomorrow may never come. Tomorrow may never come. And if you serve sin and Satan, my friend, you don't know what you'll do. Find him tonight as we sing another song. In a wonderful day, in the good things of God, we are truly grateful tonight for this service thus far. For the good singing, the good testimony, for the presence of God in our midst. And it's a little late, and I'll do my best to get through tonight before next year, if you'll be patient. <laughs> Got the rest of the year to finish now. And may the Lord bless our hearts as we think upon the good things of God. I'd like for you to let me have your attention now. Think with me, with an unbiased mind, an honest heart. Remember, only honest souls will ever make it to heaven. And 
to get them face to face with truth. There's only one thing to do about it, and that's accept it and walk in it, or forfeit your soul's salvation. So may God bless our hearts tonight. We look into his word. First, let's bow our heads in prayer again. Our loving Father, we look up to thee again in prayer with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts for the rich blessings of life that we have to enjoy today. We thank thee that deep down in our soul there is a recognition of thee. Thou art God, and beside thee there is none other. We thank you tonight for the great and everlasting love that you have for the human race. And my Lord, we can look back to the hole of the pit from whence we've been deep. We're so glad tonight for full salvation. We're glad the blood reaches deeper than the stain of sin. And we're so glad that, that the great hand of God reached down, way down in the depths of sin, and lifted us out and established our going. Placed a new song uh, in our hearts and on our lips. We love you tonight, Lord. We love thy blessed soon, thy word, more precious to us than anything in life. Father, as we stand before this audience of people tonight, we realize the responsibility that's ours. We're not up here, Lord, to entertain this audience of people. We're up here with a full sense of our responsibility. We're facing a people that's headed toward eternity. No, God, we ask that you would inspire our thinking. You would liberate us, Lord, that you would help us to feed their souls and help us, Lord, to use your word, that your spirit might bear the message into their hearts and enlighten the way before them, that eventually they might reach that eternal home of glory. Give us victory here this evening, Father, and we'll praise your name for everything or anything that you do in our midst tonight. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm reading two verses from the first chapter of Revelation, the two I read last night, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then another text, Romans 5 and 17. Yes. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more... They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now I'm using the same subject I used last night. That is the reign of God's people on the earth. And for the benefit of some of you who were not here last night and also, to make connection between the two messages, I want to give just a brief resume of what I said last night. First of all, I'll say if we'll study the Bible and place line upon line, precept upon precept, we'll be made to realize that the reign of God's people on the earth is a present-day reign Amen. and not something out in the future. According to the text I read in Romans 5 and 17, Paul said, They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Well, I'm glad tonight that when we obtain full salvation, we are made, as the first scripture lesson tells us, kings and priests unto God and our Father. And we reign right here in this life. And I said last night that sin held dominion over the entire human race from Adam to Christ. Men were bowed under the galling yoke of sin all through those ages without any opportunity 
penalty of being released from that bondage. Sin held them in its grip. Also, I told you, according to the teachings of the Word of God, the whole human race stands guilty and condemned before God because of the one sin that Adam committed back in the Garden of Eden. Romans 5 and 12, Romans 5 and 14, Romans 5 and 18. If you look in those three verses of Scripture, you'll find the Apostle Paul teaches us that by one man, sin entered into the world. That one man was Adam. By one man, sin entered into the world. And sin brought death. And death passed upon all men, for all had sinned. Verse 14, he said, Death reigned uh, from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not sinned according to after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Those that didn't sin after the similarity of Adam's transgression, death reigned over them just like it did over all others. Then in the 18th verse, he said, By the offense of one man, judgment came on all men to condemnation. That's a picture of the human race. Through the centuries of time, before Jesus Christ came into the world the first time, down through those centuries, God spoke through the prophets. He spoke through holy men of God uh, and gave him laws and decrees for man to live by. The time finally came when he gave the law to Moses uh, to give to the children of Israel. Uh, but the law did not deliver them from sin. In all that God gave through the prophets and through holy men of God and through the Mosaic law, there was nothing in it to cleanse the heart of man from sin or to deliver him from the bondage of sin. He was still, still held under its dominion and under its power. The law wasn't given to save men from sin. The law was given that the offense might abide that sin might become more sinful. God gave a holy law back there, and that law became a curse to the people. It was a bondage to them. They couldn't keep that law. Why couldn't they keep a holy law? Because of a sinful, evil nature within them that went contrary to a holy law, and God gave them that holy law. I say that sin might abound, that they might realize that within their own power they could do nothing to cleanse themselves or to break loose from sin and get themselves in a condition that God might dwell in their hearts or they might dwell in the presence of God. It would take a divine work to deliver them from the bondage of sin. Paul teaches us in the book of Hebrews that the law made nothing perfect. He said there was a disannulling of the commandments uh, going before because of the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Thank God I'm glad we're living under the better hope today. When Jesus Christ came into the world, there was a changing of dispensation. Romans 10 and 4 says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness' sake, to everyone that believes. We've got people today still trying to keep the law, yeah. try to bind the law on you. But my Bible and theirs as well says that Christ was the end of the law for righteousness' sake, to everyone that believes. Yeah. Thank God Jesus Christ came the first time to bring full salvation to lift man out of the gutter of sin and to restore to man everything that was left in the fall back in the garden. To completely salvage the human race and put them back on the plane of holiness where they can commune with God and walk with God and have victory over Satan and over sin. Thanks be to God. The word reigns means to have dominion over something. Amen. It means to exercise sovereign power and authority over 
person. And I'll say that you have dominion over sin, or else sin has dominion over you, one of the two. And I'll say if you're a black born man or woman, you're not living in sin. It doesn't have any dominion over you. Read Romans the sixth chapter and start at the twelfth verse and read through the eighteenth verse and see what you find. Paul said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Amen. Don't let sin reign in this mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Thank God the law couldn't break the power of sin. The law couldn't deliver man from sin. But Paul said you're not under the law. You're under grace. And sin will not have dominion over you. If it doesn't have dominion over you, you must have dominion over it. That should be one of the two. He went right on in the next verse. And he said, what then? Now we sin. Because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. In other words, no. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servant to obey, his servant ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, he said, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Brother, this thing gets down in the heart. Ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. You became servants of righteousness. Glory be to God, I'm glad tonight Christ came and made it possible for the whole human race, if they'll accept him, to be delivered from sin and reign over sin. Amen. God's people are a holy people. First Peter, the second chapter of the ninth verse, he said, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I say the saints of God today are delivered from sin, lustful habits, for they have victory over their tempers. They're able to control every faculty of the body, and the spirit is subject unto them through the power and the grace of God. Amen. Amen. This is a day of victory. I'll tell you, if you're not reigning over sin now, you don't need to look for a future day for God to do anything to deliver you. The provisions are already made. The table spread. Amen. I'm glad, thank God. I told you last night I used to get mad at my bicycle and throw it down. I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Got something in here that'll control this old boy. Victory. Yes, the saints of God have dominion over Satan, over sin, over self, over the world, over the beast, over his image, his mark, and his name. Glory be to God, the children of God are the victorious people. Praise the Lord. Well, that's the rest of night. Amen. All right, I trust you'll go along with the sound. I said a few moments ago, give me your mind, your thinking. Amen. Forget there's a world out here. And let's think tonight. 
How long we think, let's do it with an unbiased mind and with honesty down deep in our heart. I want you to know this one thing, put it down in